They were rich, they were brilliant. But just beneath the polished surface of these two gifted young men lurked a compulsion and obsession that in 1924 shocked the nation. Join us as we go in search of history to investigate born killers, Leopold and Loeb. In the early 20th century, there were few big cities in America quite like Chicago. It was a vibrant metropolis teeming with European immigrants. But there was a darker side as well. It was a place where tough-minded men fought tooth and nail for prominence in commerce and industry, and where gangsters like Al Capone still used violence as a calling card and business practice. It was then, and remains to this day, a city of neighborhoods. Some were more prestigious than others. In the early 1900s, few were more exclusive than the Kenwood District on the city's south side. Here, families lived in huge brick and stone mansions, raising children who were accustomed to the finer things in life. It was into such privileged households that Nathan Leopold, Jr. and Richard Loeb were born. Kenwood was a very fashionable neighborhood, about to become unfashionable, but at that time it was still had an attraction for the wealthy families, particularly the wealthy Jewish families. They all went to the same schools, they all got to know each other in the neighborhood. The families of both Leopold and Loeb were extraordinarily affluent, even for Kenwood. Loeb's father was second in command at Sears Roebuck. Uh, he was worth probably $4 million, a lot more money then than it is now. Uh, Leopold's family, uh, his father had made his money in shipping, mining. He owned a paper company. He had probably a million dollars, so there was a lot of money. Though they grew up only a few blocks apart, Leopold, born in 1904, and Loeb, born a year later, were not close during childhood. Yet their lives were remarkably similar. Both attended elite private schools. Both excelled academically. Leopold was considered a genius. His IQ was measured at 210. He spoke several languages fluently, was familiar with at least a dozen languages. This was a person who had graduated from the University of Chicago at age 17, was enrolled at Harvard Law School, a person who was a nationally renowned ornithologist, an exceptional mind. Richard Loeb was also very intelligent, although his IQ score didn't compare with Leopold's. It measured about 160. He was the youngest graduate in the history of the University of Michigan, and as I understand, still is. A very bright individual, but someone who was less drawn to intellectual pursuit and more drawn to athletics, more drawn to liquor, gambling, chasing women. While in school, Leopold became a highly regarded ornithologist, and in this rarely seen film, Leopold and a group of young researchers confirm the existence of an unusual species of bird. I took bird classes from uh, Nathan Leopold in Jackson Park. That was really the way I knew them, as older guys, and word filtered down that they were nothing to trifle with. They were brilliant. Armin Deutsch was a few years younger than Leopold and Loeb, but was raised in the same neighborhood. My grandfather was chairman of the board of Sears. Mr. Loeb was vice chairman. They were virtually next door neighbors. They rode to work every day. I was in the Loeb home often with not Richard Loeb, but he had a younger brother, Tommy, who was in my class at the Harvard School for Boys. Although they knew each other casually as teenagers, Leopold and Loeb formed an intense relationship when they enrolled at the University of Michigan. Though Leopold would later move on to the University of Chicago, their relationship continued and became intimate, and they developed a mutual fascination with criminal conduct. They both went up uh, into Michigan together, and they. Uh, uh, were on the train together. In fact, they had their first sexual experience at that time. And while on this train, 
they sort of planned their first crime, which was uh, signals and bridge, so that when they played bridge with their friends, they could cheat them. Cheating at bridge was a prank, but it went to the heart of a secret relationship that was evolving between Leopold and Loeb, allowing them to explore the moral and ethical gray zone between right and wrong. Nathan Leopold, in particular, had an active fantasy life. He secretly longed for a relationship that would transcend moral conventions. He believed this could be achieved only with a superior kind of being. And in Richard Loeb, he was sure he had found a handsome genius with whom he could share his vision. Nathan Leopold was obsessed with two things. One was Richard Loeb, of course, and the other was the philosophy of the German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche had a notion that great minds could overcome the bounds of conventional reason, conventional morality. Nathan Leopold was determined to show that he was that type of great mind who wasn't bound by conventional notions of reason or morality, and accomplishing what he hoped to with Richard Loeb, the perfect crime, would be one way he thought of demonstrating that. Leopold and Loeb embarked on a daring and increasingly dangerous double life. To the outside world, they were arrogant but well-mannered high achievers who were capable of just about anything. Secretly, though, they began committing petty crimes like vandalism and shoplifting. Before long, they graduated to arson. But they were frustrated that their exploits never made it into the newspapers. They had proved that they could be criminals and not get caught. And they also burglarized several fraternities at the University of Chicago, and the next step was to commit the perfect crime. Their relationship of mutual dependence and their fascination with crime was feeding a need for greater and more satisfying thrills. There is some kind of a synergy between Leopold and Loeb that both of them brought something to the relationship and egged each other on. And certainly we know from studies of gang behavior that when people get together, they do things that they wouldn't do by themselves. Um, it, it attains a kind of legitimacy that acting on their own wouldn't occur. Leopold was in love with Loeb and he would do whatever Loeb wanted him to. It was really sort of the two of them worked together. By the winter of 1923, Leopold, just 19, and Loeb, 18, had begun the meticulous planning of the crime that would earn them infamy. When In Search of History continues, Leopold and Loeb become the first killers of the 20th century to achieve national notoriety. By early 1924, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb had committed a number of nonviolent crimes. But the thrill from these adventures wasn't enough. Now their intentions turned much more ominous. Leopold and Loeb made exhaustive plans for committing a perfect crime. They concocted a scheme that they considered foolproof. They would kidnap a rich boy from the neighborhood, murder him, and extort money from the dead boy's parents. Almost six months of planning went into this crime. They adopted aliases, they opened fictitious bank accounts, they went to a rental car agency to do a trial run of a rental car that they planned to use on the day of the murder. They discussed all of the aspects of the crime in an ordinate detail. How the ransom note should be written, who it should be addressed to, in what way. It was a very elaborate scheme. There was no shortage of potential victims in Leopold and Loeb's affluent Southside Chicago neighborhood of Kenwood. They considered numerous possibilities, even Loeb's younger brother, Tommy, though they soon decided that killing a sibling would bring too much attention their way. On the afternoon of May 21st, 1924, Leopold and Loeb drove their rented car over to the Harvard School for Boys where Leopold himself had been educated and waited for a victim to present himself. Whichever one of their victims they had selected would have accepted a lift home from older boys who they, who they all knew. Life was so different and so benign, and, and any kind of crime was very rare indeed. <laughs> 
so no one would have uh, refused this convenient ride, though it was only a few blocks. Armin Deutsch knew Leopold and Loeb. His parents later told him that he was one of their potential victims. I followed the same route walking home from school every day. They knew it. They had followed me and all the backup candidates. The only reason that I was saved is because that day I had a dentist appointment. Deutsch was picked up by his grandfather's chauffeur outside the school that day and thus saved from an untimely death. Having decided to pick a victim at random, Leopold and Loeb were utterly indifferent over exactly which innocent boy they were going to murder that day. For several hours before the actual kidnapping, Leopold and Loeb were wandering around the neighborhood, both out and inside their car, looking for a particular victim. You know, they saw one boy here, but then he disappeared, another boy there, and he disappeared. And then all of a sudden, Bobby Franks, who had been umpiring a baseball game, decided to walk home south on Ellis. 14-year-old Bobby Franks lived down the street from Richard Loeb and had played tennis at the Loeb residence. The two predators knew that Franks trusted Loeb and probably would not hesitate to accept a ride home. Leopold and Loeb turned their car around and waited until there were no other pedestrians in the area. When it seemed clear of witnesses, they offered Franks a ride. Once Bobby Franks was inside the car, the two killers wasted little time. One of them, precisely which one is still unknown, struck Franks in the head repeatedly with a chisel, then stuffed a rag in the boy's mouth. Though no one knows exactly when he died, Frank struggled for only a few minutes. They headed south towards the Indiana-Illinois state line where they planned to dispose of the body. They didn't want to dispose of the body until it was dark. The murder had been committed around 5.30. They had several hours to kill. With the dead body of Bobby Franks wrapped in a robe on the floor of the back seat, Leopold and Loeb stopped for hot dogs and root beer. They sat in the car, ate dinner, and waited. When the cover of night finally came, they drove on to the marshlands near Wolf Lake in Hammond, Indiana. Nathan Leopold would later recall how they disposed of the body. Having arrived at our destination, we placed the body in the robe, carried it to the culvert. Here we completed the disrobing. Then, in an attempt to render identification more difficult, we poured hydrochloric acid over the face and body. Having disposed of the body, Leopold and Loeb headed back towards their homes. They stopped along the way, first to call the parents to let them know they'd be a little late, secondly to call the parents of Bobby Franks. I spoke to Mrs. Franks and told her that my name was George Johnson, that her boy had been kidnapped but was safe, and that further instructions would follow. The Franks family waited in vain for further instructions, then finally contacted the police a few hours later. Meanwhile, the two conspirators mailed their ransom note, then drove home where they burned Bobby Frank's clothes and cleaned up the bloodstains in the rental car with soap and water. But the perfect crime these two diabolical young men had planned and committed was not so perfect. It would soon begin to unravel as a vital piece of evidence would be found at the crime scene. Evidence that, as we continue in search of history, would identify Leopold and Loeb as the chief suspects. Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb had stuffed Bobby Frank's body into a marshland drainage pipe near Hammond, Indiana. A short time later, the Franks family received a call informing them that their son had been kidnapped. Four hours after that, the Franks family contacted the police, who began pursuing the unknown kidnapper.
Just after 9 a.m. in Hammond, Indiana, a local mill worker happened upon the body. The naked corpse, the age of the victim, and the prominence of the Franks family catapulted the kidnap murder to front page news. The Chicago police immediately launched the largest manhunt in city history. The police were running all over the place trying to pick up every clue they could. There were rewards promised. The uh, reporters were flocking around like paparazzi, you know, hanging out in front of the family's uh, uh, houses. And uh, the police were nabbing uh, people, bringing some of the teachers at the school where Bobby Franks uh, went to school, bringing them in, giving them the third degree, treating them rather brutally, as a matter of fact. An exhilarated Leopold and Loeb finally had the notoriety they felt they deserved, albeit anonymously. Leopold was content to go about his schedule as quietly as possible. But Loeb was drawn to the police investigation as if by a magnet. He talked to anybody who would listen, offering theories about who might have done it, even going so far as to tell newspaper reporters, if I were going to murder anybody, I would murder just such a cocky little son of a bitch as Bobby Franks. The first break in the case came just a few days later. Police recovered a pair of eyeglasses at the crime scene, glasses that had a unique hinge. There were only three such pairs of glasses in Chicago. Two of the owners had solid alibis. The third pair belonged to Nathan Leopold. State's attorney Robert E. Crow quickly brought Leopold in for questioning. When they were questioning Leopold, uh, Leopold told them he had been out birding uh, the week before, which he had been. You know, it was perfectly legitimate that he might have dropped the glasses there, so they asked him to demonstrate. So he put the glasses in his, his top pocket and tried to fall down on the rug, and the glasses didn't come out. He tried it again, the glasses didn't come out, and that was one of the things that sort of shook his alibi. At this point, suspicions that Nathan Leopold was in fact the murderer began to mount. He was grilled extensively about what he said he was doing on Wednesday, May 21st. At that time, of course, Richard Loeb was also identified as a possible suspect and was picked up for questioning as well. He was grilled and grilled extensively. They kept denying any involvement with the crime, kept repeating this story. And I think some of the investigators at some point were beginning to believe it. It seemed possible that Leopold and Loeb might still slip away from authorities. Then, two more critical pieces of evidence emerged. Tests revealed that a typewriter used by Nathan Leopold had typed the ransom note. And Leopold's chauffeur told police that the car which Leopold insisted he had been driving the day of the murder had in fact been in the garage the entire time. Now, State's Attorney Crow and his investigators smelled blood. They confronted Richard Loeb with the damning new evidence. The smooth, polished lobe cracked under pressure. On May 31st, just 10 days after the killing, Loeb provided Crow with a detailed confession of the murder of Bobby Franks. After Richard Loeb confessed, Robert Crow went back to Nathan Leopold and began to give him facts about the crime that Nathan Leopold knew only Richard Loeb knew. He knew, in fact, that his friend, who he thought would never, ever break down, had, in fact, confessed. His confession followed. Leopold and Loeb told police and psychiatrists, called alienists at the time, their story, casually recounting the explicit details of the murder their confession was clinical and unemotional, with a conspicuous lack of remorse for killing young Bobby Franks. One of the striking parts of the early interrogation of the defendants by the police was the way in which they talked about um, killing. Leopold, I'm not sure if this was to the police or to one of the alienists, described killing in a very dispassionate, and scientific kind of way. He described it as involving the same kind of emotions as pulling the wings off a butterfly. They were bound by a sexual relationship. They shared a belief that they were superior to the moral norm 
and they were convinced that they would never be caught. But when they finally confessed, the killers who saw themselves as supermen revealed themselves to be extraordinarily human. Leopold pointed the finger at Loeb, saying he was the killer. Loeb said Leopold did it. In the end, it didn't matter who was responsible for the death blow. Both Leopold and Loeb were charged in America's first thrill killing. We don't know which of the two actually wielded the blow, but we do know that the two of them together killed that boy. For all purposes, they were both equally guilty under the law, and maybe for that reason, the police, the state's attorney, didn't push that too much. At 6 a.m. on May 31st, 1924, Robert Crow came before the press. I have a hanging case, he said. The state of Illinois would seek the death penalty. The news that two wealthy teenagers had been arrested for killing Bobby Franks made the case even more sensational. While the public called for blood, Newspapers around the country and the world led with the astonishing story of Leopold and Loeb's confession. The public reacted with anger and revulsion. The devastated families of the two murderers quickly realized that their sons faced the gallows. The Loeb family, with money to spare, immediately called upon the finest criminal defense attorney in America, the famed Clarence Darrow. People. Our he was 67 years at the time. A little bit weary from having fought the good fight over the last three or four decades as the preeminent defense attorney, the fighter for the rights of the poor. And all of a sudden, this wealthy family comes along and asks him to defend their children in what was going to be a rather ugly defense since they had already pled, pleaded guilty. Rumors at the time had Darrow's fee pegged at $1 million. The families of Leopold and Loeb were accused of trying to buy their sons' lives. But Darrow, whose actual fee was closer to $100,000, was unconcerned by such talk. I think maybe, like a lot of defense attorneys, uh, Darrow was drawn to something that he knew was going to be a big media circus. He thought it was thankless, but he reasoned he might strike a mighty blow against the death penalty which caused him to accept the case. When the trial date was set for July 23, 1924, Darrow proclaimed, while the state is trying Leopold and Loeb, I will try capital punishment. When In Search of History continues, Clarence Darrow stuns the world with a plea for Leopold and Loeb and delivers this century's most eloquent courtroom argument. The trial of Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb was now only days away. On July 21st, 1924, their defense attorney, Clarence Darrow, revealed a bold plan for saving their lives. He stunned prosecutor Robert E. Crow and everyone else by changing the defendant's plea from not guilty to guilty. The maneuver meant that the boy's fates were not in the hands of a jury but at the discretion of a single man, the Chief Justice of the Cook County Criminal Court, John R. Caverly. Clarence Darrow decided that he had a better chance making his pitch for life imprisonment directly to a judge. Rather than having the responsibility divided among 12, focus it on one. It's easier for 12 to say, as Clarence Darrow said, off of them. And in Judge Caverly, Clarence Darrow knew he had a what he thought was a kindly and discerning judge. Judge Caverly actually was born in England but came to the United States when he was about six years old. He did not have uh, wealthy parents, unlike the uh, people in the case. Uh, he had to work his way through school, worked in the steel mills, as a matter of fact, carrying buckets of water. So you might say, you know, he was totally different from these boys that were being brought before him. The trial of the two teenage thrill killers who had committed what was now called the crime of the century began two days later on July 23, 1924. Public interest in the case was overwhelming. Thousands clamored to get into a courtroom that would hold barely 300. Every day there were mounted police 
uh, holding back crowds of hundreds who wanted to get in, not just to get a seat in the courtroom, but to get at those guys. They craved a hanging. Though he was surprised by Darrow's pretrial maneuverings, state's attorney Robert Crow began the proceedings brimming with confidence. This looks like about as slam dunk a case as you could imagine. You've got confessions, you've got physical evidence, uh, you've got a horrible crime. There's really no doubt whatsoever that these kids did it. Um, and in many respects, they're not especially appealing defendants either, uh, because uh, who better to hate than a rich kid who's had everything? So it seems as if from the beginning, the prosecutor's got everything on its side. Uh, but there's one other aspect to the case that I'm not sure the prosecution quite appreciated because it's a, it's a rather subtle point, and that is that high-profile cases are just plain different. They have a different dynamic to them, and you just don't know where it's going to go. Describing their actions as the most terrible criminal offense that has been perpetrated in this generation, Crow put over 100 witnesses on the stand to prove that Leopold and Loeb were merciless, cold-blooded killers. Darrow's defense was largely based on the testimony of the psychiatrists, or alienists. He felt if he could prove his clients were not responsible for their own behavior, he could save their lives. Each brought their alienists into the courtroom trying to make their points. Crow's alienists trying to suggest that these are certainly not normal kids, not your all-American kids, but kids who were not crazy, knew exactly what they were doing, and were coolly rational and lacked remorse. Darrow's alienists, on the other hand, were trying to show that Leopold and Loeb were not normal kids. These were kids who had unusual childhoods, unusual obsessions. With illustrations published during the trial, newspapers tried to explain the killer's psychology and the notion of diminished capacity, the idea that Leopold and Loeb were not responsible for their actions. Newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst even offered the father of psychiatry, Sigmund Freud, an undisclosed amount of money to come to Chicago and provide blow-by-blow -blow details of the psyches of the unrepentant killers. Freud declined Hearst's offer, citing reasons of health. Leopold and Loeb's behavior, judgment, and reasoning were debated in court. However, the sexual relationship between the two, shocking by the standards of the era, was swept under the rug by Judge Caverly for the sake of propriety. In 1924, homosexuality was not as openly discussed as it is today. Today, you'd probably find that aspect of the trial highlighted on your evening news shows. The 1924, on the other hand, this testimony was given in whispered tones with women excluded from the courtroom. And reporters, to the extent they could be, shooed away so that they couldn't understand what was being said by the witness. On August 21st, the prosecution presented its summation. The gentleman whose profession it is to protect murder in Cook County is how State's Attorney Crow described his opponent, Clarence Darrow. He then implored Judge Caverly to send Leopold and Loeb to the gallows. Society can endure, the law can endure, and criminals can escape. But if a court such as this court should say that he believes in the doctrine of Darrow, that you ought not to hang when the laws say you should, a greater blow has been struck to our institutions than by a hundred, yes, a thousand murders. As word spread that Darrow was to deliver his closing argument, seats in the sweltering courtroom were almost impossible to obtain. Those who made it inside were not disappointed. Darrow's speech was an epic denunciation of capital punishment that spanned two days and nearly 12 hours. I have heard in the last six weeks nothing but the cry for blood. I have heard from the office of the state's attorney only ugly hate. I have seen a court urged to the point of threats to hang two boys in the face of science, in the face of philosophy, in the face of humanity, in the face of experience, in the face of all the better and more humane thought of the age. 
the number of people there and knowing that the entire public was watching. And really the greatest pressure of all, which um, is the greatest pressure that any attorney can face, is knowing that on his words hangs the fate of his clients, uh, of these two young men. Uh, they may die, uh, depending on what he has to say. We are told that they planned. Well, what does that mean? A maniac plans, an idiot plans, an animal plans, any brain that functions may plan, but their plans were the diseased plans of the diseased mind. Clarence Darrow was a spellbinder, and you know, he quoted Omer Khayyam, he quoted Hausmann, uh, he quoted Nietzsche uh, in trying to prove these boys uh, not innocent, but to mitigate some of the sentence. Your Honor stands between the past and the future. I am pleading for the future. I am pleading for a time when hatred and cruelty will not control the hearts of men, when we can learn by reason and judgment and understanding and faith that all life is worth saving and that mercy is the highest attribute of man. In the end, Clarence Darrow, as he finally took his seat after his 11-plus hour summation, left Judge Caverly on the bench with tears streaming down his cheeks. Three weeks later, Judge Caverly returned to the bench with a decision that would determine the fate of Leopold and Loeb. Early on, as he began to reject some of the arguments that had been made by Clarence Darrow, saying that he wasn't terribly impressed by the psychiatric testimony, people began to think it's hanging. But if they stayed around to listen, they heard Judge Caverly begin to talk about the young age of the defendants. And that ultimately turned out to be the basis for his decision, that he just did not think it was an appropriate punishment for 18 and 19 year olds to hang them. There would be no hanging. Judge Caverly ordered the two young thrill killers to be imprisoned for life for the brutal murder of Bobby Franks and added 99 years for his kidnapping. The press reacted with scorn to Judge Caverly's verdict. Said one New York paper, Law, the bastard daughter of justice, handed her mother a frightful beating in Chicago yesterday. Leopold and Loeb said goodbye to their families and were sent to the Illinois State Penitentiary at Joliet, where they expected they would quietly continue the rest of their lives. But their strange, twisted saga still had some unexpected turns when In Search of History continues. On September 11, 1924, Leopold and Loeb entered Joliet Prison as perhaps the biggest celebrities the grim institution had ever housed. In an interview with newspaper reporters, an arrogant Leopold could not resist taking a shot at his fellow inmates. I suppose this wouldn't be so hard for some dull fellow with not much intelligence and no imagination and no real life behind him. That's what makes it so hard for me and Dick, I suppose. The incarceration of Leopold and Loeb meant an attempted return to normalcy for young Armin Deutsch, who had been targeted for death by the two plotters. When I went back to school in September following the crime, my family did their futile best to hide my tracks. I went to a different school. And the first thing that happened was a kid in my class asked me for my autograph. It was a precursor of the fact that this gave my life for many decades a, a kind of odd celebrity. People say, are you really the fellow they were going to kill? Once inside prison, Leopold and Loeb were kept apart as much as possible. But they still managed to maintain their relationship. In 1925, authorities separated the two men. Leopold was transferred from Joliet to nearby Stateville. Everyone said, and it was widely written, that he would break under the strain of prison. Far from it, he turned out to be a model prisoner. He taught classes. 
he did everything to make himself valuable as an inmate. To some, Leopold was a shining example of penal rehabilitation. He worked in the prison hospital and organized the library. In 1931, Leopold and Loeb were reunited at Stateville, and together they established a school for the other inmates. They realized if they played along with the prison system, they might get better treatment than if they tried to bang on the walls and cause trouble, and that's exactly what they did. Leopold and Loeb faded from public view for several years. Then in 1936, Loeb was slashed to death by another prisoner, James Day, after Loeb allegedly tried to force Day to have sex with him. Loeb's violent death brought him back to the front pages. One reporter commented that Richard Loeb, who was a master of the English language, today ended a sentence with a proposition. Nathan Leopold was notified that his friend was dying in the prison hospital and rushed to his bedside and was there at the time Richard Loeb expired. Leopold, meanwhile, slowly drifted into near obscurity, but maintained his busy prison activities. For a long time, Leopold probably accepted the fact that he would never be paroled. And then during World War II, he became involved in a project to try and cure malaria. Several of the prisoners volunteered to actually contract malaria so various drugs could be tried on them. Leopold was one of them. Although it had been unthinkable at the time of his sentencing, discussions about possible parole for Leopold began to surface. The brilliant schemer saw an opportunity and seized it. Leopold tried to redo his image. He made himself accessible to the press, which he had not done so for about 20 years. And he tried to present the fact that he was a model prisoner. Nathan Leopold, condemned for the slaying of Robert Franks 20 years ago, is a volunteer in a cause that deserves universal support. He went through several parole hearings unsuccessfully, but finally, in 1958, uh, at the age of 53, Nathan Leopold was released from prison. Leopold had served just 33 years of the life plus 99 year sentence he had received for the kidnapping and murder of Bobby Franks. Now that he was a free man, Leopold pleaded with the press to leave him alone. Nathan Leopold wanted to live something like an ordinary life, although that certainly was not possible. He went to Puerto Rico, where a job had been arranged for him, and began work in a mission, and lived a rather worthwhile life um, in, in many ways. I think you can look at this case as uh, many sort of stories, but certainly one of them is the story of redemption, that, that Nathan Leopold showed that he could still provide something to others, even after the terrible act that he committed that May Day in 1924. I saw him going to Puerto Rico and continuing his good work, and that, he, that that's where he would be. Later I learned that that was not true. He could travel as he wished. I understand he went to Chicago and visited family members and so on, and that rather embittered me because no family member of Bobby Frank's family ever had a joyous moment in their life again. The Leopold and Loeb case was the defining moment in the lives of all of its participants. Clarence Darrow enjoyed international fame after defending the two murderers. A year later, he was back in the news as defense attorney in the landmark Scopes Monkey Trial. State's attorney Robert Crowe's career later took a downturn. And the fathers of Leopold, Loeb, and Bobby Franks all died before five years had passed. Some have speculated that in his old age, Leopold was haunted by his youthful actions. Leopold himself suggested this in an interview. The crime is definitely still the central part of my consciousness. Very often it occupies the forefront of my attention and I can think of nothing else. 
It was also argued that Leopold's good works later in life were a way of making up for his heinous crime and the lost years spent in prison. Leopold had his own interpretation. I have tried to figure out at what point in time the whole business has become worthwhile. By certain esoteric calculations of my own, I came to the conclusion that on September 15th, 1963, I reached the point where it all became worthwhile, that the joy of being a free man again equaled the grief of those 33 years. On August 30th, 1971, at the age of 66, the convicted killer died of a heart attack as a free man. But the notoriety of the case did not die with him. Historians and observers still struggle to understand the crime of the century. One of the reasons I think it was called the crime of the century was simply because they hadn't picked out their victim in advance. It was a random thrill killing. And a lot of mothers, when they realized this, became very frightened because it could have been their kid. I have my own definition of a crime of the century. It's a crime that is so heinous and involves people who are in one way or another so celebrated that it draws the attention of the press and the public for more than the trial, but just does not go away. And I think the three crimes of this century will be the Loeb Leopold case, the kidnapping and murder of the Lindbergh baby, and the O.J. Simpson case. Though it took place nearly 75 years ago, Leopold and Loeb's crime was distinctly modern. With its casual amorality, its shocking sexual overtones, and sensational media coverage, it foreshadowed the circus trials of the latter part of the 20th century, and reminds us that treachery and violence are always nearby as we go in search of history.